Tonight, Scottish police say they will not arrest J.K. Rowling under the new hate crime laws for her tweets on transgender people. The Harry Potter author had dared the police to use the new law to arrest her, and she called the police's decision reassurance for women in Scotland who speak up for the reality and importance of biological sex. Three Britons are among seven charity workers killed as they delivered aid in Gaza in what Benjamin Netanyahu called an unintentional strike. The British government demands answers. A backbench revolt against ministers' proposals to criminalise homelessness. We hear from one of the rebels. And we look at the best, or maybe that should be the worst, political April Fool's jokes. Apologies in advance. All that and more with Mercy Maroki and Andrew Fisher, who will be with me for the next hour. It's Tuesday. I'm Trevor Phillips, live from Westminster, and this is The Politics Hub. I'm Trevor Phillips, and I'm sitting in for Sophie Ridge this week. Well, the grown-ups are away, so I had planned to begin with a mildly rancid gag about bed-blocking old people, but Sky's lawyers pointed out that while here in England we still just about allow folks to say things that might offend other people, as of yesterday, anyone broadcasting to Scotland might be breaking Holyrood's new law on hate speech if they said that. Understandably, nobody here is too bothered about me having my collar felt for stirring up hatred against old people or Methodists or the hard of hearing, in short, against people like myself. But they do draw the line at my putting the whole of Sky News at risk. In any event, it seems that this law isn't going to get much, that much use. Police Scotland announced today that they wouldn't be taking any action against JK Rowling for insisting, as she put it, that she would continue to call a man a man. But the controversy raises two really serious questions for me. First, why in a country with falling health and educational standards and the worst drug problem in Europe, this is a priority for Holyrood? And second, there were fewer than 3,000 crimes involving age, sexual orientation, disability and religion in Scotland last year. These are the new grounds under this law. Yet there were over 60,000 cases of domestic abuse reported, mostly against women. Yet a law against hate speech against women is yet to be drafted. Some numpty, I think, has their priorities in the wrong place. In a moment, we'll hear from the Scottish Government Minister responsible for trying to make this new law work. But first, let's talk to Gurpreet Nawan. Gurpreet, what is actually going on with this thing? OK, so let's start with what J.K. Rowling actually said. She published a series of posts on the social media website X in which she described a number of well-known transgender women as men and then invited Police Scotland to arrest her if she had broken the law by misgendering them. And what she was doing, she was testing the new uh, hate crime and public order law which came into effect in Scotland uh, on Monday. And under that law, it's... Uh, now a crime uh, if you're deemed to be stirring up hatred, it's a very specific phrase, against uh, people because of their age, disability, religion, sexual orientation and transgender identity. And that builds on existing laws uh, that already criminalise that behaviour uh, based on uh, race. Mm. So J.K. Rowling, she's very well known uh, for her gender critical views. She questioned why that law did not include sex as a protected characteristic, saying that in omitting it, the Scottish Government had deprioritised the rights of women and girls. The Scottish Government would say that they are drafting separate legislation that uh, deals directly with misogyny. And today, as you can imagine, Scottish ministers were asked about whether J.K. Rowling's comments constituted an offence under that new law, which carries a maximum sentence of seven years in jail. They were a bit hazy on that, mm. but Police Scotland have since confirmed yeah. that it didn't, uh, and she put out a statement afterwards in which she said that she was reassured by that decision. However, the government in Westminster uh, was more um, resolute on its stance. The Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, uh, came out in support of J.K. Rowling. We can have a listen to what he had to say. 
well, look, we're not going to do anything like that here in England. I, I, you know, we should not be criminalising people saying common sense things about biological sex. Clearly that isn't right. We have a proud tradition of free speech, and I think it just shows whether it's the SNP or the Labour. These are the wrong set of priorities for the country. I'm focused on delivering on the things that really matter to people. So do you support J.K. Rowling's approach? Again, it's it's not, not right for me to comment on police matters, individual matters, but what I do support very strongly are people's rights right to free speech and nobody should be criminalised for saying common sense things about biological sex. So that's Rishi Sunak's view, but uh, Hamza Youssef, the First Minister, said that this law was necessary to deal with what he called a rising tide of hatred in society, but it's also serving another purpose because the SNP has been leveraging, leveraging the issue of trans rights to create dividing lines between itself in Holyrood and uh, the UK government in Westminster. And in the process, it's bleeding into this broader debate about Scottish independence by shining a spotlight on Scotland's right to pass its own laws. And the SNP has already tested the limits uh, of the devolved government by clashing with the UK government in the courts uh, when the latter used powers of veto uh, over Scotland's uh, Scottish government's gender recognition the reform bill, 35. yeah, which would have uh, paved the way for self a self ID system for people who wanted to change uh, their legally recognised sex. So. This is just the latest chapter in a very long-running battle between the two, and we can expect that it won't be the last. OK, well, thank you, Gopik. Very clear. We're not going to hear the... Not, we won't have heard the last of this. In fact, we won't have heard the last of it tonight, because a little earlier, I spoke to Siobhan Brown, the Scottish Minister for Victims and Community Safety. Minister, can we start by clearing up a couple of uncertainties? Um, if I said uh, that non-Christians are bound for hell. I'm not going to ask you to adjudicate on that, but I'd like you to tell me who would decide in the first instance whether that could be hate speech or not? OK, if I, if I just may just give you a little bit of history here. Stirring up hatred um, has been uh, against race for over 40 years in Scotland, England and Wales. So just for your spe specific question there, uh, what this... this <laughs> hate crime in Scotland that was enacted yesterday does mean is that it would be an offence to incite hatred, to be abusive and threatening, stirring up hatred towards an individual, which would cause them fear and alarm. If you were just saying that in your house or on your social media, I'm not going to be, be saying what the police Scotland would say, but that's your expression, your freedom of expression, which is respected within this bill. Yeah, but uh, if I can be a little specific, let's say that um, I said that uh, non-Christians like that Hamza Yusuf are bound for hell, uh, and somebody else, as I understand it, any individual, might be able to report me to Police Scotland uh, for a hate crime. Is that true or is it not true? It would be up if you were causing fear for an individual through your comments. I think we have to be clear here, Trevor, that England and Wales have had stirring up hatred against no, religion I, I, and I'm, race for the last 15 years. For, so what forgive me, I'm, I'm just asking a thing about the mechanics of this. I'm not even asking whether such a comment is wrong or not. I'm just asking, would someone be entitled under the new law to report me to the police? It would be up to if an individual was personally threatened and in fear of your com comments and they felt that they wanted to report it, then it would be up to the individual, then it would be up to the police, police to decide whether or not there was any criminality involved in those comments. Uh, and it wouldn't, happen, it wouldn't have to be the person I'd named uh, and presumably uh, nobody would have to take into account whether I was making, trying to make be funny or whether I really meant it. It's just the words that count. What I'm trying to get here clear here is what is the law actually permitting? Okay, what the law is doing is we're protecting people from the core, uh, from the hatred and prejudice within our communities. So this, as I said previously, this has already been in law for over 40 years for race and in England and Wales for religion and sexual orientation well, 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 for the last 15 well, years. So what well, we're with, doing with respect, in Scotland... With, with respect, uh, uh, as a former chair of the Commission for Racial Equality and the 
uh, Equality and Human Rights Commission and one of the authors of the 2010 Act. This isn't exactly the same law because uh, the historic law, the law that we have in England and Wales relating to race, doesn't incorporate uh, specifically the uh, co provision that anybody, whether they are involved or not, can report you to the police. And that's what I'm really trying to get at here. Is that the case or not? If anybody felt threatened, they could report it to Police Scotland. There is a very, very high threshold of uh, criminality uh, because freedom of expression is embedded into the legislation that has been brought into place in Scotland. OK, let me ask you another, just another, I suppose, technical but straightforward question. If I say something that is heard in, in London, but, that it's, but I know that it's going to be heard in Scotland, am I liable... Uh, to be covered by this legislation as well. Could Police Scotland investigate me in that, those circumstances? Or do I have my to be in Scotland or Scottish? My understanding this legislation does, it is for people in Scotland and for, for crimes that happen in Scotland. Oh, so the act of, what, of hate speech has to be committed in Scotland? That, that's my understanding. That's what we've, we've incorporated into the Scottish Act, yes. Oh, so, for example, J.K. Rowling, who says in her tweets, Arrest me if you dare, if you dare, but I'm abroad. That so that actually doesn't count because she says this abroad. I'm not going to comment on individuals' behaviour or or, or okay. comments. All I'll say is what is in this hate crime act is a protection for people from minority groups with protected characteristics from abuse and from threatening behaviour that would cause them fear or alarm. The the, the reason that that I'm asking all of these questions, I guess, is that. I think there's still a little bit of confusion about how this will actually work, who would actually uh, operate it. But there's also a separate question, which is one of priorities. Um, last year, there were about there were 5,738 hate crimes reported in Scotland. Uh, let's assume that everybody who got reported was prosecuted in some way. Let's say that you get 6,000 next year under this legislation. What guidance are you giving to the police? I'm not saying it's operational, but presumably they have to have some guidance about what is more important than what else. Are you giving them guidance about whether uh, hate speech against age is more important than one against religion, or is it the degree of ven venom? No. What, what is the no, story no. here? No, they're all protected characteristics um, under this Act. And we have been working very uh, very closely with Police Scotland throughout bringing in this legislation and myself within the last year um, before it has been introduced on, on um, yesterday. But one of the things is they have been given a very, very clear steer um, throughout this legislation when it was went through Parliament in 2021 about the, the protection of freedom of expression. The issue of priorities here seems to me quite an important one. And I just want to put this to you. Most of the conversation, whether you wanted this to be the case or not, has been about uh, speech about sexual identity, trans uh, women, trans men, and so on. Uh, I looked at the data for Scotland last year. That is the financial year ending 2023. In that year, there were 55 cases of hate crimes, which had a trans element. That was down from 86 the previous year. Meanwhile, the government has said that its hope for legislation on misogyny has to wait while this uh, piece of legislation goes through. 55 versus 61,934. 61,934 have to wait while the 55 gets dealt with. Is that the right order of priorities here? Yeah, if I could just give you a little bit of history, because this was considered going back in 2021 when the when the legislation was going through the Scottish Parliament. But the Scottish uh, women's groups at the time did not want to include it. They wanted a further separate bill on... Um, from coming from the Scottish Parliament. What we did do is that we... We, we had uh, Helena Bar Baroness... Um, Helena... Uh, have an independent review, which we took the recommendations forward. And last year, we consulted on that to bring through a specific misogyny bill, which will be introduced later this year into well, the Well, you Scottish could have introduced that any time you liked. 
but we were, but we were working with that. When there were 62,000, as opposed to just over 50 crimes, did you choose the one that affected 50 rather than the one that chose, affected 62,000? No, not at all. And I, and I appreciate that there is very polarised views regarding transgender identity. But this we have to remember that this Hate Crime Act does incorporate against age, disability and the race, religion. So it's not all about transgender. Yeah, Women the, the, specifically the, will the have a misogyny. If, if I just may finish, Trevor, if I can. We, we, and the we total are of those is about 2,500 as opposed to 62,000 domestic abuse. Yes, and that's why we, we really need to have a separate bill, because I also have violence against women and girls, and so we have a separate bill for misogyny moving forward, as we have been listening to our yep. women's group and stakeholders that did not want it included in this, this act. Siobhan Brown, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Let's bring in our dynamic duo for tonight, broadcaster and former government advisor on gender policy, Mercy Maroki, and the former director of policy for Jeremy Corbyn, Andrew Fisher. Um, Mercy, does this risk backfiring for the SNP? Um, well, I have spent the last year and a half of my life, as you mentioned, there working in government in, in both gender equality, race policy, and um, you know, Minister Brown there is talking about this is about tackling uh, comments that cause fear and alarm, and I'm in fear and in alarm at her comments because she doesn't <laughs> quite seem to know, from my reading of it, what she's talking about. She doesn't really seem to have a grip on how, what this, the detail of this law is and how dangerous it potentially could be. Will it backfire um, on the SNP? Well, I think we saw Nicola Sturgeon had quite a difficult time towards her final days in trying to navigate the issue of trans women, particularly trans women going into female prisons, um, and that blighted her, her last few days. I think this will backfire on the SNP because it will become evident that it's a waste of police time, that Scotland has massive violence issues. Um, you know, eight in 10 burglaries in Edinburgh are still going unsolved. I was looking at some of the stats earlier. Um, and the police have basically said, you know, we don't have the capacity to investigate some of the low level crimes. So the idea that the Scottish people would put up, put up with this while the, the stuff that you mentioned goes ignored and all their other issues with crime goes ignored, I think will definitely lead to a backlash. Andrew, as, um, as a piece of policy making, mm -hmm. what, what, what grade would you give it? Uh, I think it's actually a, a fairly sensible measure. And unfortunately, we're being distracted by talking about the transgender issue, which is very polarising. But actually, the Section 66 of the 2020 Sentencing Act here in England and Wales, which was passed under the current Conservative government, outlaws hate crime against transgender people specifically in that rule. So this isn't wildly different. And actually, you know, what is unique about this piece of legislation, the thing that is interesting about it, is it incorporates age for the first time, which is something you referred to in your introduction. But if we look at the very serious um, abuse we've seen exposed in care homes and so on, which has definitely had an aggravated age-related element to it, those could have been prosecuted um, under existing laws for assault and so on as an aggravating factor in a way that they can't be in England and Wales. So actually, I think that's good. You know, we have laws on, you know, if I assault somebody and am racially abusive to them, then that is an aggravating but, factor that but, can increase my but, sentence. But don't forget, th this is actually about speech. This is not about other kinds of actions. This is about speech. It is about speech, but it's, that speech often happens in a context where other things are going on, other crimes are being committed as well. So it can happen with that as well as apart from that. But this isn't anything particularly unique, I don't think. And, of course, the police will act sensibly. There need to be, as I think the, the minister rightly pointed out, that it has to be threatening or abusive. Merely insulting someone do isn't think, a crime. Do, do you think it's really sensible for... I know that it's a maximum term, but seven years... Seven years is the maximum term um, under this Act. How can we possibly say it's sensible for, for somebody to receive but any... The, but the maximum penalty, if I copy a DVD, and not that people use those anymore, but if I did, um, the maximum crime for that, copyright infringement, is 10 years. So let's be but serious yeah, about no, this. But it signals, the, law is often it signals the really... intention of before, the before we come to the end of this, just quickly, uh, Andrew, mm. um, it's interesting that Labour Party nationally, or in the UK, says not touching it, and Asawa, Labour leader in mm. Scotland, says... We're, we're down with it. Well, they voted for it in the Scottish Parliament, but actually, as I said, there's similar laws already in place in England and Wales anyway. All right. You are watching The Politics Hub. Coming up... The growing row within Tory ranks against plans that critics say will criminalise homelessness. We hear from one of the rebels. And next, 
completely unacceptable. With three British nationals among seven aid workers killed by an airstrike in Gaza, Lord Cameron piles pressure on Israel. We're here to talk about climate change okay, tell and, and wines. There's a recent um, article, I think, in The Times that came out, and it was saying that in, you know, in sort of as, as little as 20 to 30 years, we won't be drinking Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay. We'll be drinking completely different grapes. Don't be because, ridiculous. Yeah, apparently so. I think there's a lot of Where's scaremongering, but this is from the Loire. OK. So, cool climate, you know, France. This is the spiritual home of Sauvignon Blanc. Absolutely yeah. lovely. This is from England, so this is Sussex, East Sussex. Oh, sparkling. Yeah, sparkling. But it goes to show, you know, with, with climate change, it's all about countries like it's England. It's cold as well. It's very, yeah. <laughs> Definitely the temperatures are going up and it's been proven, but it's saying, you know, it, it's shocking the way, you know, they're saying in, in sort of by 2070, it could be as much as three degrees hotter than it is now. Goodness. And so what the does end that of... mean for wines like this? So wines like this, so, so we'll be this looking at other... This is from France. This is from France. Yeah. So we'll be looking at potentially other grapes being grown in France. So more Mediterranean varieties, for example, who are better suited to more arid conditions, Greek varieties, so anything. So the Sauvignon Blancs and the Chardonnay... Santorini, Chardonnay's... actually, that's a... Oh, my goodness, you're absolutely right, mm. because that's one of the most hostile environments for growing grapes. Mm. And they've nailed it with a Sirtico, you know, lovely, beautiful white wines. Mm. So I think it's probably that. So the Americas, California, instead of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, we'll be drinking things like, you know, Torrigo Nacional from Portugal, which is one of the key ingredients in port, for example. So reds as well. Mm. So the thing with, you know, the hotter it gets, the higher the sugars in the grapes, so higher the alcohol as well, but the lower the acidity, which is not what you want. You want something with, even for reds, you want something with a good acidity because it's essentially the structure of the wine. So you, and you don't want the alcohols to be too high. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has acknowledged that Israeli forces were responsible for an airstrike that killed seven aid workers, including three British nationals. They were delivering food in Gaza for the charity World Central Kitchen, which has now suspended operations. The charity says the strike happened as the workers were leaving a warehouse in Deir al-Bala in central Gaza early today. The United States, Poland and Australia, whose citizens were among those killed, are demanding an investigation or an explanation from Israel. Video shows a hole blown through the top of a vehicle, which is clearly marked with World Central Kitchen's logo. The charity says the team was operating in a de-conflicted zone and was coordinating with the Israel Defence Forces about its movements. Admitting Israel's responsibility for the strike, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said everything would be done to avoid another similar tragedy. There was a tragic incident of an unintended strike of our forces of innocent people in the Gaza Strip. This happens in war. We are checking this thoroughly. We are in touch with the governments and we will do everything for this not to happen again. The Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, posted on X Twitter, I spoke with Israeli First Minister um, uh, Katz, Foreign Minister Katz, to underline that the deaths of World Central Kitchen aid workers in Gaza, including three British nationals, are completely unacceptable. Israel must urgently explain how this happened and make major changes to ensure safety of aid workers on the ground. Let's speak now to the former UK National Security Advisor, Lord Ricketts. Good evening, Peter. Hello, Trevor. Um, how serious do you think what happened today is, or what we learned today is? Well, it's horrifying and it's heartrending, 
Uh, and it should absolutely not have happened. Uh, the Israelis have, uh, as they claim, one of the most modern and professional armed forces in the world. They have complete visibility on what's going on in Gaza, dominate the airspace and the land. They should have known that these were humanitarian workers. It wasn't just one vehicle attacked. From what I've seen, three different vehicles strung out over a couple of kilometers, each of them pinpointed by Israeli strikes. No doubt not intentional, but it absolutely should not have happened. And I think this has to be a wake-up call to say that the Israelis have, first of all, they've got to move fast to a ceasefire now, but they've, in the meantime, got to be much more proportionate and careful um, and targeted about the strikes that they make. These Israeli armed forces seem to have forgotten that they are occupying forces. They have obligations under international law to protect humanitarian workers and medical workers. Do you accept the fog of war argument at all in this situation? Well, of course, mistakes happen in war, yes. But as I say, this seems to be three separate pinpoint attacks on three vehicles. Now, that seems to me to be uh, more than careless. Uh, and the justification of an unintended, you know, a mistake, something miscarrying, that does happen in war. This seems to me to go beyond that and to point to a systemic problem with the Israelis doing their targeting and not taking sufficient care to avoid civilian targets. Of course, this isn't the only incident that's happened in the last couple of days of significance. We've also seen the attack on an um, Iranian consulate. Um, what do you think the Iranians are going to do about that? Yes, I mean, that's a pretty escalatory step to attack the consulate of another sovereign power. Um, I don't think the Iranians want to land up in a full-scale war with Israel, uh, with the Americans standing behind them, but they will have to find some way of retaliating. I'm sure they'll want Hezbollah to escalate the cross-border strikes that they've been carrying out against uh, Israel. And, and let's not forget, Hezbollah has 10,000 uh, missiles, far greater arsenal than Hamas ever had. So there are real risks here for Israel uh, in escalating the tension um, in uh, Syria and in Lebanon and provoking the Iranians, really challenging them, defying them to find some way of responding to it. It's a dangerous game. I mean, it's, it, it's quite a difficult situation for Israel, isn't it? It's quite a dangerous situation, as you put it, for Israel. Not only do they have still to uh, carry out their mission in Gaza, as you say, there is something going on in the north from Hezbollah and so on. And, of course, now the Americans seem to... The tone of the American pronouncement seems increasingly exasperated. Yes, I have never known such a wide gulf between... Uh, a president in America and an Israeli prime minister. And the fact that the Americans allowed through a UN Security Council resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire, uh, that is uh, pretty unprecedented. The fact that the Americans are uh, building a new jetty to receive aid supplies. This was an American charity, uh, the World Central Kitchen, uh, whose people were attacked in this last strike. Yes, there is an enormous gulf now between the Americans and the Israelis. The one lever that the Americans have not pulled is to suspend um, arms supplies to Israel. Uh, that, of course, would be a very major step indeed. It would be unpopular in some parts of Congress. But it seems to me each time uh, this ratchets up uh, the escalatory ladder, that must get a greater risk. Well, indeed, the Biden administration, I think, dispatched a shipment of... Um both fighters and uh, quite a lot of uh, 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 bombs in the last few days. Do you think there is actually any prospect that the Americans might say, unless you pull back, unless you turn down the temperature, we are going to uh, hold up on, on our arms deliveries? I mean, that's never happened as, as, as far as I know. Uh, as far as I know, it hasn't. But yes, I think we are getting closer and closer to that. I don't suppose they would cut off all arms, but they might put restrictions on the use of some of the weapons that they're supplying that Israel is using uh, with these attacks on civilian targets. I mean, my own view, there's somewhere else which has a much higher need, uh, more urgent need for um, American weapons, and that is Ukraine. Ukraine is fighting an existential war for its survival, desperately needs American weapons, Israel has got an enormous uh, number of weapons over the last six months. 
Uh, and from the way they're using them in Gaza, I think there have to be really serious questions about whether they should be getting any more. I would like to see at this point uh, the UK decide that they are going to suspend arms export licenses to Israel. I, mean, I think there is enough evidence now that Israel is, to put it diplomatically, not paying enough attention to its international humanitarian law obligations to protect civilians, to protect humanitarian workers and medical workers. And I think each time there is another of these horrors, uh, they must be getting closer to the point where the Americans start putting some restrictions on their arms. That's that's quite a big step. I, I have a f uh, feeling, I'm not... Um... Uh, where of when, but I have a feeling we have done this before, that we have essentially suspended uh, or forbidden the export of arms to Israel, but it would be quite a big step for us. Uh, Lord Cameron, of course, has been rather waspish in the last uh, month or so, but uh, do you think there is any sign that the Foreign Commonwealth uh, Office might actually recommend that to the government, to the uh, number 10? Well, I think there was some recording uh, recently suggesting uh, evidence that there had been advice on those lines. I don't know whether that's true. Um, but Lord Cameron has said a couple of interesting things recently. First of all, in the House of Lords, he said that the Foreign Office were studying carefully and gathering uh, evidence on the issue of whether Israel is respecting international humanitarian law. And then he reminded people as well uh, on the media that one of the conditions of UK arms export licenses is that countries um, abide by international humanitarian law. So put those two things together, and I think it's certainly under consideration, yes. Peter Ricketts, thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Let's bring in Mercy Maroki and Andrew Fishner. Andrew, um, where does this go now? I mean, there is a feeling that things are heating up a bit, but it feels also like everybody's stuck. The Americans, for the Americans to take another step uh, in forcing Israel's hands would be a big deal. Similar for us, uh, for the Israelis under Benjamin Netanyahu's leadership are absolutely committed to the course of action. It doesn't feel like there's a way out for anybody. Well, I think there is. The US could easily stop this, as it did in the early 80s when uh, Israel was invading Lebanon at the time. Uh, Ronald Reagan picked up the phone and it stopped. The fact of the matter is Israel is armed considerably by the US. The UK does sell arms and, and supplies to Israel, but it's on a much, much smaller scale. Ours would be a kind of token gesture you know, of kind of diplomatic pressure. The US would put a stop to this, and Biden's been incredibly weak in not doing so. And you kind of wonder, what is the threshold for this? We've talked about the the innocent people killed today who are humanitarian workers, but when the International Court of Justice says there's a plausible case for genocide, surely that's the point at which you go, maybe we shouldn't be putting more arms into this conflict. When the UN Security Council, if it's going to have any meaning at all, passes a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire, surely that's the point where you stop putting in weapons. So it, I think we're very late in the day to be talking about this. It, it should have happened months ago. Really. It's worth saying, genocide is a very big word here. And it I, is I, a big think, word, but I, it's, it's said that it, the International Court of Justice, not my words, their words, they are the most high court in the world, has said there is a plausible case. Clearly, uh, it, whether or not there's genocide, there's clearly a massacre going on. There is clearly ethnic cleansing of both the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, as we but, see. So, you know, we are in a very precarious situation where 30,000 people have been slaughtered? Uh, of course it's a precarious situation and of course it's in incredibly distressing that this has happened and nobody wants to see um, the death of, of any innocent civilians but that's how wars play out. I think, you know, from, from Israel's perspective, they were attacked by Hamas on, on the 7th of October. Um, there are still Israeli hostages that H H Hamas are holding. Um, Hamas had early a leader, a Hamas leader had said they would repeat October the 7th, a second, third and fourth time. And clearly Israel uh, does feel a continued threat um, and won't stop until they feel that they've eradicated the threat that is Hamas. So um, it, it's so much more complicated, I think. I think in this debate, it has become very polarised and there's a tendency to pretend um, that, that, you know, even if there was a ceasefire, that Hamas is sort of a, a, a moral a, a player, a player that's playing on fair terms. And so that, that's where I think that's but, Israel's but, case. They need to eradicate the threat that is Hamas. Very quickly, Andrew. 
Well, I think, you know, it's very clear that neither the Netanyahu government or Hamas are partners for peace in this, that neither have, have proved themselves to be. They're both, okay. incur you know, they're both in favour of the eradication of each other. You know, there is no good on this, but the only time there has been a release of hostages was during the last ceasefire. If you want to uh, release the hostages, there needs to be a ceasefire so they can safely be released. OK. Well, we shall no doubt be talking about this endlessly, sadly, mm. for, a, uh, for on this programme and others. Developments in the Middle East are pretty sure to feature in tomorrow's newspapers. We'll have our extended press preview and news review from 10.30 this evening with tonight's news and tomorrow's headlines. Joining us will be the editor of the Jewish Chronicle, Jake Wallace-Simons, and the Observer's chief leader writer, Sonia Serdo. You're watching The Politics Hub. Coming up... When politicians play the fool or play us for fools, We'll look at some of the 1st of April's hits and misses. And next, the growing row within Tory ranks against plans that critics say will criminalise homelessness. We hear from one of the rebels. Now to a growing row and rebellion within Conservative ranks over the Criminal Justice Bill. Critics say the bill that is drafted so widely that it could result in homeless people being arrested for having an excessive odour. Sky's Kay Burley put that to the Education Secretary, Julian Keegan, this morning. The bill states that rough sleepers might be considered a nuisance if there's an excessive smell. So if you smell, you might be arrested. Well, I mean, I think the most important thing, as Not I say, funny. is to make sure we help people off the streets 
No, I'm not saying it's funny, and I'm, I'm saying the most important thing is to help people off the streets. That's why should we're putting people be arrested pounds if they smell into this. Well, no, people should not be arrested just uh, if they smell. But of course, um, what we'll be doing is be considering any legislation. Why does the bill then say that rough sleepers might be considered a nuisance if there's an excessive smell? How ridiculous! Some might say to put that in the bill. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I haven't looked at that uh, detail of it, but I mean, I, I guess the word is excessive, and I don't know. Uh, I don't know what they mean then. But... Joining me now is the Conservative MP for Gloucester, Richard Graham, one of those who opposes ministers' plans to criminalise homelessness. Uh, good evening, Mr. Graham. I, I don't know if you were able to see uh, the inter interview, um, but aside from sheer terror at Kay Burley's. Uh, Ice Queen, look. Uh, how, what's your reaction to that clip, what Gillian Keegan said? Well, Trevor, look, if I, if I may, it's wrong to describe me as one of the rebels and to sort of categorise this issue as one of growing rebellion or something like that. What, what's happening here is that in the Criminal Justice Bill, which is an incredibly wide-ranging bill, it includes, to my great joy, because it's something I've been campaigning on for several years, uh, a new element that uh, refers to spiking, which is incredibly important, particularly for young people, covers masses of different things, drugs, murders, transferring prisoners, you name it. There are two bits that stand out where I think there is still a debate to be had. The first one is all to do with rough sleepers, and the second one is to do with aggressive begging. And on the first one, there are a number of my colleagues who've got real concerns about this, fundamentally because this bill does away with the two 200-year-old Vagrancy Act, and what a number of us don't necessarily want to see is that replaced with something that is almost as draconian. Rough sleeping is different from aggressive begging, on which I think actually a number of us have got real concerns and do want to see the measures being put in that are in the draft bill. But the rough sleeping element, I think, is uncomfortable because it's not a criminal activity in itself, and that's the bit we have to get right. I, I understand. Forgive and forgive me for putting it that way, though. Uh, to be absolutely fair, you may not see yourself as a rebel, but as you know, they view these things slightly differently from uh, vantage point of number ten. But you've explained clearly what your uh, your concern is. Uh, of course, the act was, I think, originally drafted, if I remember rightly, um, in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars with soldiers on the streets and so on. But do you think the, the government, I guess, would say? that actually some of the actions of people in that state are intimidating. Uh, they are, you know, th there may be issues, but actually this is a matter of public order and, um, you know, public tranquility. Yeah. So, Trevor, I think where we all agree is that, look, I don't want to see tents uh, in the centre of Gloucester, in uh, shops, doorways, in church uh, graveyards. Uh, I want to see everyone who's in those tents or in sleeping bags properly housed because that's better for them. It's better for the city. It's better for visitors. It's better for everybody. The question is, is how you go about tackling it and what is the best way to do it. And we've tried, as other cities have tried, lots of different ways. I think I'm coming closer to a strong belief that one really practical way of tackling this is to have a whole stock of modular housing available, mostly for individuals, because sometimes those who are, are rough sleeping are very what difficult exactly? to live with. So modular housing is, is what looks like a, a container that has been converted to become a dwelling unit. Quite often they have uh, heat pumps to provide the heating. They've got underfloor heating. I've been inside them. They're good. They really are good. Bristol is using them already. And I, I do think that we need to have these as a place that we can put, particularly for temporary uh, rough sleepers, put them into so that they're not there on the street and, and likely yeah. putting themselves I in the way of danger or bad health. I think, I think the current generation calls them pods. But it seems to me that part of your yeah. interest here is actually more to do with um, tone rather than, uh, in a sense, the, the substance. Well, did, is the government's language helpful here? For example, the former uh, secretary, the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, referring to homelessness as a lifestyle choice. Is, has that put things, in a sense, in the wrong context? 
Well, at the time, I tweeted out um, quite strongly saying that I thought tone does matter and that wasn't the right tone. It's not the way we tackle the problem uh, here in Gloucester and it's not the way I believe we should be tackling it nationally. So different people will have different views on, on her uh, choice of words. Um, there are some people who, for whatever reasons, and they vary, um, at the moment when you go and see them, do not want to be helped into accommodation. They may have had bad experiences beforehand and so on. But that is not a good general description of the problem we face. And the individual issues and forgive the way me. we care for forgive, them, forgive I think, is really important. Forgive me Sorry. for interrupting you. We've got a piece of breaking news I want to come to in just a second. But before we let you go, can I just ask you, um, do you think this bill is going to pass? Uh, the bill the should pass if it doesn't pass. run out of time, but this bit of it may be changed. Richard Graham, thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you. Now, some breaking news. The Prime Minister and Benjamin Netanyahu have had a call this evening in the aftermath of three British aid workers being killed by Israeli forces in Gaza. A Downing Street spokesperson said... The Prime Minister told Mr Netanyahu that uh, he was appalled by the killing of aid workers and demanded a thorough and transparent independent investigation into what happened. The Prime Minister said far too many aid workers and ordinary civilians have lost their lives in Gaza and the situation is increasingly intolerable. The UK expects to see immediate action by Israel to end restrictions on humanitarian aid de-conflict with the UN and aid agencies, protect civilians and repair vital infrastructure like hospitals and water networks. The Prime Minister reiterated that Israel's rightful aim of defeating Hamas would not be achieved by allowing a humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza. We'll bring you more on that developing story as it comes. Um, let's bring in Mercy Maroki and Andrew Fisher. I want to talk about that homeless rebellion and rebel we discussed with Richard uh, Graham in a moment, but uh, Mercy, um, government's ramping up the pressure, I think, on Israel. Mm, yeah, it's interesting. I, I found uh, in that statement you've just read, um, the condemnation part uh, came first and then he said, but you do have a right to defend yourself as a sort of addition. And I think at the start of the conflict, it was certainly reiterating that Israel has a right to defend itself very much first. And then, you know, towards the end of the, the, the statement is where you'd find we expect you to abide by international law. So we, I think we are definitely seeing um, a shift in tone, one, one of concern. Um, and I think that's echoed by what President Biden and, and America's actions and tone has been recently. Andrew, this has been... Um a slightly sticky issue for the Labour leadership. Um, the sense is that they will line up behind this, do you think? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it, it's interesting that the word ceasefire didn't uh, occur in that statement. I mean, after all, Britain voted for a ceasefire at the UN Security Council. And again, we see this kind of almost pantomime, I think, from the US and UK. Tougher words, but no actual action. And I think Israel sees that very clearly. You know, Israel's a very tough negotiator. Um, it sees diplomacy in very forceful terms. If it isn't shown a fairly strong uh, response, it's not going to react. Um, and you've seen that throughout history where the US has said, no, Israel comes back in line. We are seeing war crimes being committed on an almost daily basis, and we're not seeing that stop. Uh, if you want it to stop, you have to put in line sanctions, whether that's the stopping of arms sales or wider trade sanctions as well, as we have on other countries that are in conflict that we don't approve of. OK, well, we'll keep an eye on the way that story is moving this evening. Uh, you're watching the Politics Hub. Coming up, when politicians play the fool or play us for fools, we look at some 1st of April hits and misses. Coming up on the UK tonight at 8, condemnation of Israel over the airstrike in Gaza that killed seven aid workers, among them three British nationals. We'll get the latest from Gaza and we'll speak to a British doctor who's just returned from there about the conditions facing aid workers. And with humanitarian organisations already pausing deliveries of crucial supplies, we'll be discussing the implications for the Palestinian people. That's the UK tonight at 8.
I'm Martha Kellner and I'm Sky's US correspondent based here in Los Angeles. We aim to be the best and the most trusted place for news. I'm Martin Brunt and I'm Sky's crime correspondent. We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. I'm Helen Ann Smith, I'm Sky's Asia correspondent and I'm based here in Beijing. We help you understand the world with us. I'm Neville Lazarus and I'm Sky's reporter based in Delhi. Welcome back to the Politics Hub. Now, yesterday was April Fool's Day, but the Politics Hub wasn't on air, so we couldn't bring you the attempts of our beloved parliamentarian to pull our collective leg. But we don't want you to feel you've missed out on all the lols, so a day on, we thought we'd take a look at some of the best. Or maybe that should be worse political April Fool's jokes, but let's give it a go. Number one, Shadow Health Secretary Wes Streeting put this out yesterday, saying that he'd got a new gig cooking on the TV show Lorraine. He later followed up by, uh, to, to say that one of his best friends had been taken in by the joke. I think that friend needs help. Politicians <laughs> and media outlets have been at it for years. Back in 2010, The Guardian revealed Labour's new strategy of presenting Gordon Brown as a hard man willing to take on then-Tory leader David Cameron. Step aside, posh boy, it read, along with vote Labour or else. It was, of course, an April Fool's gag. I'm not sure this one fooled too many people. Before the Brexit referendum, Nigel Farage trolled the internet by tweeting that he was announcing his support for Remain. And that same year, David Cameron found it can be risky putting out serious announcements on the 1st of April. His tweet about the national living wage left people wondering if it was real or not. Now, let's bring in uh, Mercy and Andrew. Um, do these work at all? Well, I'm, I'm just still trying to think about the fact you said lols, which is a very young and trendy, <laughs> young and trendy thing to say. So, um, so, and why, why would that lols. be a problem with me? <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to be ageist, Trevor. We know that that's... Uh, Thank you, because Scotland are, you know, <laughs> exactly. my friend is police Scotland. Um, actually, I think it's, it's funny that the, the Scottish Hate Crime Act came out uh, well, it came into effect yesterday, which is, of course, April Fool's, <laughs> which I thought was quite uh, ironic, ironically timed. Um, it was a gag waiting to happen. But uh, I think, to be honest, it's a bit cringe, I find. It's a bit dad jokey, I, I think, when these sort of middle-aged male politicians, nothing against middle-aged people, but <laughs> middle-aged male politicians think they're being hilarious <laughs> by um, tweeting April Fool's jokes. It's just, you know, it doesn't work. OK, Andrew, uh, come... Answer back for your generation. I mean, um, honestly, you've just been trashed. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm not going to. Uh, I think you're right, Mercy. We agree. Um, finally, there we are. It's nearly the end of the hour, and we do. But I think generally, um, I'd like politicians to be competent at politics. I'd rather they kept away from comedy. I think there are professional comedians, and they're professional comedians for a reason. They're good at being funny. Did, uh, did um, Jeremy ever try an April Fool's joke? I mean. It wouldn't have been a policy matter, I can assure you, if it was. Um, <laughs> and as a matter of policy, I would have advised him against it. But uh, I, not that I can recall, no. Yeah. It's funny. That, I mean, in a way, 
But the April Fool's joke seems so kind of contrived now. Yes. You, you, you sort of imagine that there's a committee yeah. sitting around thinking, what can we do that's yes. funny? Uh, and somehow we don't get the, the jokes that we used to get, like, I don't know, the most famous one that people always talk about is uh, Dennis Healy saying about Geoffrey Howe's speech, it's a bit like being savage by a dead sheep or... Mm. Um, the very old one, I think it was Bevin, mm -hmm. Ernest Bevin, say uh, about Herbert Morrison, Peter Mandelson's grandfather. Mm -hmm. uh, there goes, uh, somebody else said, there goes Herbert Morrison, he's his own worst enemy. And Bevin said, not as long as I'm alive, mate. <laughs> uh, we don't, they're not funny anymore, are they? Yeah, I think it's it's a bit a bit try hard in my opinion uh, when these politicians are tweeting, and I I agree actually I would like them to it, they should be good at doing the serious stuff first I think before uh, they get the license to, to to be to be cracking these jokes. But having said that, you know I think people would be surprised how funny some politicians actually are. Um, Theresa May is actually very funny in in person, and she never came across like that. So sometimes it is it would be nice to see you know that their lighter side as well. I, I have. To say I, I have some evidence of, of that I, I when I was in uh, the uh, EHRC she was my minister and she was she could be quite yeah. witty yes. um, but she can't, sadly masked it which mm. I think was to her, her detriment um, any funny Labour politicians that you can think of. Uh, who's, who's Frank the witches? Dobson used to be quite funny. Frank was good. Wasn't Frank he? Dobson was quite funny not always that politically correct it has to be said in today's uh, era but um, he he did tell some quite funny jokes that made me laugh a couple of times. Yeah, yeah, I, I remember famous uh, Frank Dobson joke, canvassing on the fourth floor of council estate, uh, and he'd come up in lift, and lady, and he was giving them, we're going to stop war, we're going to produce equality and all the rest of it. And she said, did you come up in the lift? And he said, yeah. And she said, stinks of urine, doesn't it? Mm. And he said, yeah. And she said, so you want to stop war, but you can't stop them pissing in the lift. <laughs> <laughs> that is it from us tonight. I'll see you tomorrow at 7. Up next, it's the UK Tonight with Greg Milam.